in this, uh, this is a joint work of uh, uh, Adam Parkhurst and Daniel Spielman. Ikhaev Sriva Tabat, right? The speaker is uh, Ikhaev Sriva uh, Tabat from India. Uh, he's now in, uh, uh, from uh, Microsoft India and he got PhD in Yale University. Uh, uh, he won uh, many uh, prizes in this field and uh, recently, especially in uh, 2014, he got the Science uh, Joint Korea Prize. And today's uh, uh, lecture title is uh, Ravanjuan graphs and the solution of Kadi's uh, single problem. Please welcome Dr. Mikhail Sportman. Okay, so thanks a lot for the introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, such a great conference, and thanks everybody for coming to the you know the last talk of the whole conference. So, okay, so. Um, so this is uh, uh, this is about the Cadizan singer problem, restricted invertibility and Ramanujan graphs. It's a little different from the title printed in the proceedings, and it's joint work with Adam Marcus and Dan Spielman. Uh, so let me start by telling you what the Cadizan singer problem is. So it's a problem uh, that came out of mathematical physics out of the work of Dirac in the 30s, and uh, Dirac asked the following question: How should you parameterize the states of a quantum system? Okay. So, you know, what does this mean? So a quantum system is described in terms of observables and states. So an observable is a quantity, you know, that you want to measure, like position or momentum or energy or something like that. And mathematically, it's a self-adjoint operator on a complex separable Hilbert space H, which you can just think of as being L2 of the natural numbers. Uh, and uh, a state is just a vector in this Hilbert space. So Dirac called these things ket vectors, so you have some ket psi, which is in this Hilbert space. And in this, uh, you know, formalism, the question is, what is a good basis in which to represent the states? So Dirac gave a prescription for doing this in his book, and it's the following. So first what you do is you find a maximal family of commuting, commuting observables that you're interested in measuring. Okay? So you find some physical quantities, their observables should commute, so the operators should commute, there should not be any uncertainty principle. So you can measure them all simultaneously. Okay, so find a maximal such family. Uh, let phi i be the common eigenbasis of all of them. So because they all commute, they have common eigenvectors. Uh, and then just use this basis to write your states. So every state psi has some coefficients alpha i in this basis, and this is what Dirac said you should do. Now, several nice things happen when you do this. Uh, you know, the, the first one, and the important one, is that if you have some arbitrary state psi, if you measure everything in this family f, if you uh, measure all these observables, it collapses to a unique eigenvector phi i. And this is uh, probabilistic, you know, it, it goes to phi i with probability, you know, uh, the square of the coefficient alpha i. Okay, so these are these probability amplitudes. And uh, the point is that this phi i is unique. So if you make all these measurements, it fully determines this particular state. And at the bottom of it, the reason is, is something very concrete. It's that each of these eigenvectors phi i is completely determined by the observables in f. Okay, so if you make all these measurements, there's no ambiguity about what i is. Okay, so this construction is called a complete set of commuting observables, and it's something you might have done if you studied physics. And you know, if you do this for the hydrogen atom, you get these like four quantum numbers and L, M, S. Okay, so uh, so Van Neumann looked at this in you know in the 1930s, and uh, he raised a couple of objections. So there are a couple of uh, issues with this. So the first is you can't just diagonalize an infinite matrix. So you can certainly do that in finite dimensions, but not infinite matrices don't necessarily have eigenvectors. So what are these phi i that you're talking about? And the other objection is that uh, Dirac actually needed to consider some uh, certain objects that were more general than vectors, which he called delta functions. So if you're interested in observables that are continuous, like position, you can't just make do with vectors in a Hilbert space. You need something called a delta function, and you know what is that? So Van Neumann came up with this uh, different formulation of quantum mechanics based on operator algebra uh, to get around these issues. And here the objects are slightly different. So the observables are still operators on the Hilbert space, and you're going to look, uh, you know, in particular, you look at the algebra of all bounded self-adjoint operators uh, generated by these bounded self-adjoint operators on the Hilbert space. Um, and commuting observables are almost the same as well. It's an abelian subalgebra of B of H. 
And the thing that really changes is the notion of a state. So a state is no longer a vector, it's just an arbitrary positive linear functional on this algebra, which maps the identity to one. Okay? So, you know, this new notion still includes vectors. So if you give me a unit vector v, then I can make a state rho of a, which is just v inner product a v. Okay? And you can check that this is a positive linear functional with this property. So this is a state, it's called a vector state. Uh, but actually, there are a lot of other states, okay? So this is a truly more general notion. There are a bunch of other states that are not like vectors. And you can also check that a convex combination of states is a state, and the set of states is compact. So it has extreme points, and the extreme points are called pure states, okay? So this is the, these are the basic objects. And so Kanison and Singer were, you know, sort of looking at this in the 50s, uh, and they asked the following question, does Dirac's, you know, prescription for constructing this complete set of community observables, does it still work in von Neumann's uh, setup, okay? So assume all the observables are discrete. So uh, remember that, you know, uh, you know the, the punchline in this, in this construction was that if you get this maximal family F, then each of the eigenvectors is completely determined by the observable there. So the analog of this, if you start talking about operator algebra, is this statement, is this question, so does every pure state on the diagonal sub algebra D of H, which is, this is the algebra of just diagonal operators, yeah. this infinite diagonal matrix with bounded entries, uh, does every pure state on this sub algebra have a unique extension to the whole, the whole thing? Okay. So this is, uh, this is what became known as the Kattin Singer problem. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's not so easy to think about these, these arbitrary pure states on this, this algebra D of H because you know, they look pretty weird. They're like, they're indexed by non-principal ultra filters and things like that. So they're, they're pretty weird looking object. So, uh, Kanisner and Singer proposed an approach to resolve this question by sort of talking about them indirectly, okay? So in their paper, they, have, they, they, uh, they have, uh, this conjecture, which is a conjecture, a sort of combinatorial type conjecture about operators in B of H. It's called, uh, well, it's now called a paving conjecture. So the conjecture is this. Uh, for every epsilon, there's a constant k, which is some finite number. So that for every zero diagonal matrix M, every zero diagonal bounded operator, uh, there's a partition of the numbers into sets T1 through Tk, so that if you look at each submatrix, if you just look at the uh, submatrix indexed by Ti, the norm of that, the operator norm, is bounded by epsilon times the operator norm of the whole thing. Okay, so the picture is something like this. You have some, you know, you have some matrix, you're interested in partitioning uh, the coordinates into a finite number of blocks, so when you look at each of these restrictions, the norm is strictly smaller by some, by this epsilon. Okay, uh, and the point is that so this such an object is called a paving, and if these things exist, then it implies that these are pure state extensions are unique. Okay. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Zero diagonal means the diagonal entries are zero. I should have said that. Okay. It's important. Okay. So this question does not have any mention of states. It's a question about uh, some sort of uh, property of these operators, and uh, nonetheless it implies that these pure state extensions are unique. Now this statement has this very nice property that by a compactness argument, this was discovered by Anderson in 1979, it reduces to a statement about finite matrices. So you know, honestly about like finite complex matrices. And the statement is this: there are some universal constants epsilon less than one and k. So that for any zero diagonal finite matrix with complex entries, you can literally just partition the uh, coordinates into k blocks so that each of these submatrices is normal, strictly less than the normal band by some constant epsilon. So this is a statement that even, you know, you could probably understand that in high school so it's, it's more, more accessible. Okay, so once this happened, uh, there, uh, this was shown to be equivalent to a number of other conjectures uh, about partitioning, basically partitioning finite matrices and finite sets of vectors into balanced parts in some way. And all these things were shown to be equal to or imply the Kattison Singer uh, conjecture. And uh, important progress was made on these conjectures. So, Bergen's theory showed that uh, it's true if you take k equal to log n, log of the dimension. So, this doesn't solve the problem because remember, I need k to be a universal constant. <coughs> and then Berman et al. showed that it works for matrices uh, with non negative entries, but that's, that's very special. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is this uh, result that we proved last year. Well, we proved one of the stronger uh, conjectures in this, in this family called Weaver's conjecture KS2. And then this implies that all these other conjectures are true as well and resolve the original problem. Okay. 
So let me tell you what reverse conjecture is. So um, it's about quadratic forms of uh, finite sets of vectors in finite dimensional vector space. So you have m vectors, v1 through vm, in n-dimensional space. I'm going to be interested in looking at their energy in some direction u. So u is a unit vector. The energy, which is just a second moment, is just the sum of inner product squared with u. With u. So it's this quadratic polynomial here, sum of u inner product vi squared. And it's easy to see that this is a quadratic form in this matrix, sum of vi vi star, where this, these are just, you can, this is vi times vi, these are just outer products, okay? So, uh, so this is some quadratic polynomial, it's a quadratic form. Here's an example, you have four vectors in two-dimensional space. If you plot this quadratic form, you get an ellipse. And in general, if you, if you plot the level sets of these things, you get ellipsoids. So you should think of, these, you should think of this as just being an ellipsoid. And you know, the, the axes of these ellipsoids are given by the eigenvectors, and their lengths are the eigenvalues. Okay? So you should think of a quadratic form as just a bunch of vectors that define an ellipsoid. Uh, so the object uh, that we're interested in is an uh, isotropic set. Okay, so a set of vectors is called isotropic if its energy is equal to one in every direction, which just means that this ellipsoid is literally the sphere. Or if you add up these outer products, you literally get the identity. So that's called an isotropic set. And uh, you know, uh, Weaver's conjecture is about partitioning isotropic sets into sets that are close to being half isotropic. So what does that mean? It means I'm given some m vectors that look like this. I want to find a partition into two sets, red and blue. Okay, so uh, each of these sets will define its own quadratic form, which will have its own ellipsoid. And in general, the shapes of these things will not look like the sphere. They will look like something else, whatever the eigenvalues are. And you know, most partitions, many partitions are going to be degenerate like this. And what I want to do is I want to find a partition into uh, two sets so that each set, the quadratic form is close to half of the identity. So I want these ellipsoids to be close to half the sphere. And what that means is I want the eigenvalues to be close to a half. So I want the eigenvalues to lie between, let's say, a quarter and three quarters. Um, and you know, it's easy to see that this is equivalent to saying I just want the eigenvalues of each part to be bounded from above by three quarters. Because you know, the red part is a complement of the blue part. Right? OK, so, uh, so I want to always be able to do this. And I can't always do this. Okay, so there are some canonical examples where you can you cannot partition um, an isotropic set. So, for example, consider the standard basis, just n orthonormal vectors. So there's no way to partition this into two sets that are not degenerate. So certainly there's no way to partition this into two spheres. And in general, there's a big problem if any of the vectors has large norm, if it has norm you know bigger than a half, basically. So Weaver's conjecture is that this is the only obstacle. So if, if for any set of isotropic vectors where the norms are bounded by some constant delta, so think of delta as being 0.1 or something, but the question, the conjecture is there is some constant, so the norms are less than that constant, then there's a good partition. Okay, that's what we written that term. And uh, this is a theorem that we prove, it's a strong version of uh, Weaver's conjecture. Suppose you have m vectors in n dimensions, and the norms are bounded by epsilon, and they're isotropic. Then there's a partition into two sets, t1 and t2, so that the eigenvalues of each part are bounded by half plus three epsilon. Right? So if epsilon is less than one sixth, then certainly this is bounded away from one. But more, but you know, as epsilon goes to zero, this approach is half, which is optimal. Okay, so that's the statement of the theorem. Um, let me, okay, so before telling you about the proof of this, let me, uh, uh, let me, you know, sort of look at, uh, you know, one natural approach to try to find these partitions, which is randomly. So, you know, given m vectors, I want to partition them into two sets, so the two sets are sort of balanced. One natural thing to try is just put each set uh, in, you know, t1 randomly with probability half, and t2 with probability half. So if you do this, then it's been shown by Rudelson and uh, by, uh, I think also by Borgan before that, in slightly different parameters, that um, uh, if, as long as the norms of the vectors are bounded by 1 over log n, where n is a dimension, this actually works. So if the norms of the vectors are going to 0, then this random partitioning scheme gives you this balanced partition that you want. Uh, unfortunately, this log n is really essential in this random approach. So the, here's a tiny example. Uh, it's sort of a very instructive example. I have a constant number of copies of the standard basis. So uh, e1, e2, e3. Let's say 100 copies. So all the norms are bounded by 1 over 10 or something like that. Um, 
And now if I, if I choose a partition randomly, you can easily prove that with high probability, one of the directions will be saturated. All right, this is like throwing balls into bins, basically. So what this means is that good partitions are rare. They're, they can actually be exponentially rare. So you need to do something other than random to find them. Okay, so nonetheless, this is a zero that we proved, and now I'm going to uh, tell you about how we prove this zero. So the proof is based on this uh, new method that we call uh, interlacing families of polynomials. Uh, this is some sort of variant of the probabilistic method, and uh, you can use it to show that a random matrix has small norm with non-zero probability. Okay, that's the kind of thing it's useful for showing, and it can even show that things happen, even if they happen very infrequently. So I'm not actually going to show you how to use this method to prove Weaver's conjecture. I'm going to show you how to use it to prove this uh, simpler theorem called restricted invertibility. And uh, the proof still contain, contains most of the uh, conceptual, uh, well, contains most of the ideas. So what is restricted invertibility? It's a, uh, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a slightly easier task. So again, I'm given an isotropic set of vectors, all right? And instead of trying to find a partition, I just want to find uh, a sort of largish subset of the vectors. I'll define what that means precisely in a moment. With the property that this subset is close to the identity on its back. So this subset is very non-degenerate in some sense. Okay, formally, what does this mean? So this is a statement of the theorem. This is proved by Rogan and Zafiri. And the version here is with refinements by Vershinen and uh, with Nance Buhlmann. So here's the theorem. Suppose you have m vectors in uh, n dimensions, and they're isotropic. There's no constraint on the norms now. Then for every k less than n, uh, there's a subset of the vectors of size uh, k, uh, with the property that, um, yeah, uh, there's a subset of the vectors of size k with the property that uh, uh, the k eigenvalue of the matrix sum of vi vi star for i inside the set s, okay, uh, is at least this quantity, one minus square of k over n squared, and then over n. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, okay, so the subset is of size k, so it has k vectors, it has rank at most k, it has at most k non-zero eigenvalues. What this is saying is that all those eigenvalues are bounded away from zero, that they're large, all right? So it's saying that um, this set of vectors is very far from being singular on its back. So if, it, if, if these vectors are actually orthogonal, then the bound you get on the right would just be one, or well, it would just be their, their length. And what this is saying is that you can get some other large bound. Uh, and you should also look at, I mean, to see what, you know, see how, how good this bound is, you can look at the case k equals 1. So for k equals 1, the theorem implies that there's a single vector, such that the, you know, largest eigenvalue of vb star, which is just the squared norm of v, is at least n over n times, you know, some 1 minus 1 over squared n. And n over n is the average squared norm of the vectors, right? They're m vectors, they're isotropic n dimensions, so this is actually tight. Uh, you can't hope to find a single vector of norm larger than this. And the cool thing is that even if you take a set of size n over 2, which is much bigger, this says that you only lose a constant factor. You lose, you know, 1 minus squared half squared or something like that. Okay. So you really get something that should be thought of as being close to a uh, thought of. Okay. So this is the statement of the theorem. Uh, this has, this by itself has, uh, you know, other applications in many areas, like harmonic analysis, bionic space theory, etc. And the original proof uh, uses uh, some functional analysis techniques as well as random sampling. But I'm going to show you a really simple proof of this theorem that's basically the whole proof in 20 minutes, and it contains most of the ideas for Kaiser's theorem. Okay, so, so, so how are we going to prove this? So we want to construct a subset of size k, right? Okay, so I'm going to define uh, random vectors, r1 through rk. These are vector valued random variables, and they're going to be in red. Red means random. And each of them is going to be uniform from my set of vectors v1 through vn. And notice that each of these random vectors has covariance matrix equal to 1 over m times the identity. That's simply because the sum of their outer products is equal to the identity. And I'm going to take this random set to be my subset s. Okay. Now, so I'm, I'm interested in this matrix sum of ri ri star, where the sum is over k terms, and each one is an independent rank 1 random matrix. So this is some random matrix. I'm interested in the k eigenvalue of this, the least uh, non-trivial eigenvalue. So, you know, the first question you could try to ask is, what is the expectation of this k eigenvalue? So this turns out to be bad because there are examples where it's actually very small. So a random example is again very bad. 
And it's also not very easy to compute the least eigenvalue of a random matrix without really knowing very much about it. Okay. So what we do instead is we study these random matrices by looking at their characteristic polynomials instead. So you know, for, for matrix A, I'm going to let chi of A be the characteristic polynomial of A. So determinant of Z i minus A, it's a univariate polynomial. All the matrices I'm going to look at are Hermitian, so it has real roots, which I'm going to call lambda 1 through lambda n decreasing. And you know, I'm interested in the kth eigenvalue of this matrix, which is just the kth root of its characteristic polynomial. So I haven't really done anything yet. And the main idea is to look at this object, the expected characteristic polynomial of this random matrix. All right. So this is some random matrix. For each matrix, I have a polynomial. I'm just going to average all of them. OK, so this is sort of a weird thing to do, because what I'm really interested in is the roots of these polynomials, right? But when I average polynomials, I actually average their coefficients. I don't average their roots. And the relationship between roots and coefficients is really nonlinear. So in general, you shouldn't expect to get much out of looking at the expected characteristic polynomial of a random matrix, right? But in this case, it turns out uh, that something very nice happens. So we can show that with positive probability, uh, the kth root of this random characteristic polynomial is at least the kth root of the expected characteristic polynomial. All right. So this is uh, so this statement would be trivial if this expectation was outside the lambda k. Right. That would be a trivial statement. The point is that it's, I'm not looking at the expected uh, kth root. I'm looking at the kth root of the expected polynomial. But the averaging is done with coefficients. And this happens because our polynomials have a special structure, which is a consequence of them uh, of the matrix being a sum of independent random rank one matrices. And the structure is called interlacing. Okay. Okay, so here's, here's an outline of the proof, given that I'm going to go this route by looking at these expected characteristic polynomials. So what's the situation? I have uh, given m vectors so that the sum of their outer products are equal to the identity. I'm going to define these k random IID uh, vectors, R1 through Rk. Each one has a covariance matrix, one over n times the identity. Uh, and the proof is going to have three steps. So the first step is to show that the expected characteristic polynomial has real roots. So a priori, even that is not known, right? If you average some real rooted polynomials, you might get something which does not have real roots. So that's the first step, and I'm going to call this expected polynomial E sub k. The second step is something uh, you know, uh, more quantitative. I want to show that these roots are large. So I want to show that the kth root of this expected characteristic polynomial is at least whatever, you know, the number that I want. And the third step is to prove what I just claimed on the previous slide, that the kth root of this, of this random polynomial is at least the kth root of the expected polynomial with positive probability. In other words, there actually exists some actual polynomial whose roots are at least as good as the expected polynomial. Okay, so let me start with step one, show that this thing is real rooted. So this uh, uh, actually comes down to a very simple lemma, uh, which is very easy to prove, but very important. And here's the lemma. Suppose I have a matrix A, and I have a random vector R, whose covariance matrix is some multiple of the identity, C times the identity, right? Then the expected characteristic polynomial of A plus R, R star, so A plus its outer product of R with itself, is just equal to the characteristic polynomial of A minus C times its derivative. Okay, so this is just this operator 1 minus C times derivative with respect to Z applied to the polynomial, the characteristic polynomial of A. Okay, so the proof of this is sort of three lines long, and uh, it's based on this very simple linear algebra identity where you can write the characteristic polynomial of a rank 1 update of a matrix. So I'm going to call adding a rank 1 matrix like this a rank 1 update. You can write the characteristic polynomial of a rank 1 update of a matrix in terms of uh, the original characteristic polynomial times 1 minus this quadratic form in the inverse. All right? And this is just because determinant is a homomorphism. And then you just take expectations on both sides with respect to R, which is my random isotropic vector. And you just get this formula out because it's because this thing is a multiple of the identity. You literally just get the derivative. Okay, so once I have this, I actually know what my expected characteristic polynomial is because the matrix I'm interested in is the sum of k independent random rank one matrices. So it's just k rank one updates, and I know that a rank one update is just a standard differential operator. 
So therefore, my expected characteristic polynomial is just this differential operator applied k times to the characteristic polynomial of zero, which is z to the n. So this is an explicit formula for the expected characteristic polynomial. Okay. And once I have this, I'm basically done because there is this fact, which is also has a very nice three-line proof. If you don't know it, you can try to find it. Which is, if you take a polynomial and subtract off a multiple of its derivative, that preserves real rootedness. All right. So z to n has real roots. Each of these things preserves the real rootedness. Therefore, the expected characteristic polynomial also has real roots. That's all, that's all proof of step one. Okay. So for step two. Uh, we need to get an estimate on where these roots are. Right now we know they're on the real line, we want to know where they are. So here, again, I'm going to use this formula. So this formula really, you know, isolates the important structure in this polynomial. Uh, so remember that I, I had an expected polynomial that I called ek, I'm going to rescale the variable by m. I'm just going to write ek of mz, and this is going to have this even cleaner formula without the 1 over m. It just uh, keeps subtracting off the multiple of the derivative k times starting with z over n. Okay, so it's i minus to, uh, i minus d to the k um, of z to the n. Okay, so you can observe that this is just equal to z to the n minus k times uh, some nth power of it's the same differential operator applied to z to the k times some constant. All right. So this is well. This comes down to taking the transpose of the matrix, but you can you can prove this as well. So, I mean, once I tell you this, it's TV. And now this object, where you start with a you know a z to the k and just keep applying these differential operators, this is a known object. So this is called an associated Laguerre polynomial. It's a classical orthogonal polynomial, um, and uh, you know a lot of stuff is known about its roots. So people have been studying the roots for a long time. And there are many estimates on what they are, and in particular, there's this estimate of Krasikov, which says that the kth root is at least one minus square of k of two, right? Square times okay. So that's exactly what we want. The expected polynomial is literally a Laguerre polynomial, and we know that its roots are what we want. And if you have thought about, you know, the the Wishart ensemble and random matrix theory, then this probably looks familiar to you. Um, okay. Uh, if you thought that was cheating, where you know I just observed that it's some known object then actually it's not very hard to prove this bound from scratch. So let me tell you about that as well, because that is required in the proof of a uh, weaver's connector. So here's how, you, here's how you prove this kind of bound from scratch. So you're inter you have some polynomial, and let's say you're interested in its roots. You're interested in the zero set, which is an algebraic object. Uh, well, it, you, know, you can observe that the roots are just the poles of the logarithmic derivative of the polynomial, which is this rational function p prime over p. So it, uh, if you plot it, it looks something like this. It has poles at the roots. And now this is an analytic object. And uh, you can study the perturbation of roots of a polynomial under these differential operators by studying what happens to this log derivative. And uh, we did this in a paper with Batch and Spielman a few years ago. And we showed that, well, the log derivative of a polynomial varies in a very predictable way under these differential operators. So if you know, if you have a polynomial and you apply these operators, we can control what happens to the roots by studying this log derivative, and that gives you exactly the same bound again, the type bound. And this is also not, it's not very difficult, it's a couple of pages. Okay, so in any case, we have a couple of ways of getting a bound on these two. Uh, so now we know that the expected polynomial is great, and we want to show that there's some actual polynomial which matches the behavior of the expected polynomial. We want to show that the uh, least root of this random polynomial is at least the least root of the expected polynomial with some problem, with positive problem. Okay, so the basic phenomenon that I need to understand to be able to do this is what happens to roots when you average polynomials. So the expected polynomial is an average of some real rooted polynomials. You know, what are, how do its roots behave? So, you know, the, mo the, the most vanilla version of this question is when you just have two polynomials, two real rooted polynomials, P0 and P1. And uh, you want to know how the roots of the individual polynomials are related to the roots of the average. Okay, so in general, some pretty bad things can happen. This is a canonical bad example. The two polynomials are x minus 1 squared and x plus 1 squared, which are quadratics. And when you add them, you get something that's strictly positive, so it doesn't even have real roots. So forget about being less than or greater than, they're not even real. 
And this is this is not a very this is not a degenerate situation. You can move these around, and you still get you know complex roots or roots in the wrong place. Typically, you don't get that the roots of the average polynomial are averages of the roots of the individual polynomials. However, if you move these quadratics uh, like this so that the roots alternate, like in this picture, then something very nice happens. The average polynomial actually uh, uh, looks like this, and each root of the average is an average of the corresponding roots of the individual polynomials. All right? Okay, so uh, you know the, the basic idea is to ident identify a sufficient condition for uh, for this to happen and exploit this, right? Because this is exactly what we want. We want the roots of the average to be well, averages of the individual roots. Okay, so the sufficient condition is called common interlacing. So okay, let me tell you first what interlacing is. Uh, so suppose I have a polynomial Q of degree n minus one with some real roots alpha i and a polynomial P with the roots beta i. And Q interlaces P if their roots alternate, as shown in this picture, and let's say the largest root belongs to Q. So that's what interlacing is. It's a very old classical notion. And you know, I can also define it for two polynomials of the same degree. I just uh, I just add a root at the bottom. So the, the interlace of the roots alternate like this in this picture. And the main theorem about common interlacing, uh, which this technique relies on, is the following theorem. Suppose you have monic a collection of monic real rooted polynomials P1 through Pn, and they have a common interlace. So there's a single polynomial which interlaces all of them. Then uh, the kth root of the x average polynomial is between the largest kth root and the least kth root over all the polynomials. All right. So this has a very simple proof, which I will show you on this slide. So here's the, here's the proof. So here are my polynomials. They're cubics. Uh, there are three polynomials and they're cubics. Uh, they're monic, so they go to infinity uh, at plus infinity and minus infinity over here. And my assumption is that they have a common interlacing. So the common interlacing is a quadratic polynomial with two real roots alpha 1 and alpha 2. And the roots of this uh, common interlacing split the real line into three intervals. And each interval contains exactly one root of each of my polynomials. That's the definition of common interlacing. So in each of these intervals, each polynomial changes sign exactly once. So let's say I'm interested in the bottom root, lambda 3. Let me look at this bottom interval. I can shrink this interval so that its endpoints are actually at the roots of two of my polynomials. And still the same property is true, that each polynomial changes sign exactly once inside this interval. OK, well now if I look, at the, uh, if I look to the left of this interval, then each polynomial is negative. right? because the polynomials go to minus infinity. So each polynomial is negative uh, to the left of this interval, therefore the average is also negative. Uh, I'm sorry, not, the average is also, let's say, non-positive. And if I, look, if I look at the right end point, then inside this interval, each polynomial changed sign exactly once. Therefore, each polynomial is now uh, positive. Right? Therefore, the average is also positive. So it's positive after the interval and negative before the interval. It's a continuous function, so it must be 0 and that's the that's whole proof. Okay? So because you have these intervals which each contain one root, the roots of the average polynomial end up being, you know, some uh, end up lying in the convex hull of the corresponding roots of the individual polynomials. Okay. So that's the proof of that theorem. I mean, that, that literally is uh, the proof. There's nothing special about the bottom. You can do it for, uh, for any other uh, root. And this is, this is what we're going to use to prove step three. Okay, so what do we, getting back to our situation, what do we want to show? We have um, this random matrix, sum of R i r i star, and we're interested in showing that the kth root of its expected polynomial is at most, you know, the largest value of this kth root over all possible uh, points in the probability space. So unfortunately, these polynomials, the ones that we get by ranging over all possible values of the r i, they do not have a common interlacing. So you cannot actually apply the theorem uh, directly. Uh, but there is a lot of interlacing going on here if you start if you look at the partial sums Okay, so we're interested in a sum of k independent random rank one matrices. Let's look at the first j of them. It looks like that And now uh, the point is if I look at this partial sum if I condition on all the previous terms Then each of the each partial sum is an average of rank one updates of the previous partial sum 
So this is sort of a trivial fact. If I look at the expected characteristic polynomial of Sj plus 1, the sum of the first j plus 1 terms conditioned on Sj, it's just the average of characteristic polynomial of Sj plus every possible choice for the j plus first vector, right? Okay. So this is good because of Cauchy's theorem, which you might already know, that if you have any matrix in any vector, the characteristic polynomial of the matrix interlaces the characteristic polynomial of a rank one update of the matrix. All right. So this polynomial I'm interested in is an average of rank one updates. And they're all rank one updates of the same matrix, SK. So therefore, they have a common interlacing. Right? If you look at any partial sum, the things that you average have a common interlacing just because rank one updates create interlacing. Okay, so it turns out that you can apply, you know, by holding on to this, uh, this fact, you can apply this theorem on the previous slide inductively to these characteristic polynomials of partial sums and to certain, you know, differential operators applied to them. And by a pretty easy induction, you can prove this statement. Okay? So the interlacing is created by rank one updates. That gives you these rails of, of, with which you can reason about the averages, and you just get this quite easily. And that, that's it. That's literally the whole proof of the restricted convertibility theorem. And it gives you, I mean, this is a sharp bound. We can't, this, you can show that the bound is sharp. Okay. So, um, so let's just step back and see what the, you know, uh, what the, um, you know, main components of the proof were. So we're interested in some random matrix, which is a sum of independent random rank one outer, outer products, which are isotropic, this guy. And we studied it by looking at its characteristic polynomial. Uh, and we looked at the expected characteristic polynomial. And the, you know, the, the, the main structure that we used was that because these are rank one updates, the expected characteristic polynomial is some sort of, uh, has a, some sort of nice formula in terms of these differential operators. Uh, this immediately implied that the expected characteristic polynomial has real roots, because these differential operators preserve real rootedness. It also implied, it also was useful to get a bound on the roots, because we can understand how these operators perturb roots of a polynomial by looking at the log derivative. And then finally, we needed to relate this expected polynomial to our actual polynomials uh, in the probability space, and this was done by interlacing. So again, the rank one structure is what was useful. This creates interlacing and allows you to do that every Okay, so, so that's what the proof looks like. Now, there's an important generalization of this. So this is for IID isotropic random vectors. Uh, you know, a natural generalization is to consider the case of independent random vectors with no other constraints. So not isotropic, not anything, right? Not IID. And this is a much more general kind of random matrix, and you can use this to encode the random partitions that you need to prove Kazan-Singer, or to prove a weaver conjecture. And it turns out that the same components that I showed you in the proofs just now can be used to prove this much more powerful theorem. So here what happens is you again end up with a differential formula for the characteristic polynomial, but it's a multivariate formula. So you, it ends up being the case that the expected characteristic polynomial is some restriction of some large, nice, multivariate polynomial with different partial derivatives for different random vectors. All right. Once you have this, uh, again, this implies that the expected characteristic polynomial has real roots, but now you have to appeal to this theory of real stable polynomials, which if you don't know what it is, I really encourage you to check this out. It's a multivariate generalization of real rootedness. It's a very well understood thing at this point. And, uh, well, by reasoning about this real stability of this multivariate polynomial, you get real rootedness of the expected polynomial. Uh, again, the same formula can be used to get a bound on the roots, but now instead of looking at the log derivative, you look at the L of the of the log of the gradient of this multivariate polynomial, which is a little bit more complicated, but uh, roughly the same type of proof gives you quantitative bounds. And then uh, it turns out this, in this generality, this differential uh, representation, this is so you know, this is very, very, this already contains the structure of interlacing. You don't need a separate Cauchy generalizing theorem. It implies also that you can compare uh, some actual polynomials with the expected polynomial. Right? So it's some, there's a multivariate notion of interlacing. And once you have that, you can prove this main theorem. Okay. So, uh, so I want to end by saying a little bit about rounders and graphs uh, in the remaining five minutes. Um, because it's an interesting topic in itself, 
And it also uh, is a good example of how versatile this, uh, this proof technique is and how you can use it to reason about different kinds of objects. So, what's a, so Ramanujan graph is a special case of what's called an expander graph. Okay? An expander graph is a sparse uh, regular graph which is very well connected. So it's a finely undirected graph with, uh, uh, with, with the same, every node has the same degree and it's well connected. So what does well connected mean? It, you can define it in many different ways. You can say that every set of vertices has many neighbors, or you can say that a random walk in the graph mixes quickly. There are many definitions of being well connected, and they all turn out to be sort of equivalent. And these graphs are really useful. They're really useful in computer science, and they're also really good counterexamples and examples in many areas of math. So, um, if you've never seen expanders before, here are some pictures. The graphs on the left are expanders, a Pearson graph and a random graph. These are very well connected graphs in any way you choose to measure well connected. And these are not expanders, the grid and the cycle. So that's because you can cut these into pieces by cutting a few edges. That follows. Okay, so the definition of expansion that we're interested in is called spectral expansion. So it's a particular way of saying that a graph is well connected. So suppose I have a D regular graph G. So D is think of it as a constant like three. And look at its density matrix, which is a symmetric matrix with real eigenvalues. Um, so let's look at this eigen, let's look at these eigenvalues. So there's something you can say right off the bat. So if the graph is deregular, then it's easy to see that the all ones vector is always an eigenvector with eigenvalue equal to D. Alright? So D is an eigenvalue of every deregular graph. Similarly, if the graph is bipartite, you can check that the eigenvalues are symmetric about zero. So minus D is an eigenvalue of every bipartite graph. So these eigenvalues are not very interesting because every graph has them, so they don't tell us anything about the graph, so I'm going to call them trivial. So once I've you know, set this up, I get this definition of an expander. A graph G is a good expander if all the non-trivial eigenvalues are small. So they're all, they're all close to zero. All right? So here are some examples of very good expanders, a complete graph and a complete bipartite graph. So you can check that all the non-trivial eigenvalues are equal to zero, which is as good as it gets. But of course, you know, the, the chat, you know, you, we don't just want some finite small examples, we want to construct infinite families of expander graphs with B, the degree fixed, and N going to infinity. So we want an infinite family of three regular graphs whose spectra look like this. Uh, and it turns out there's a limit to how well you can do this. So this is shown by Alan Bopana in 1986. That if you give me an infinite sequence of graphs, its eigenvalues cannot be clustered more than this number, 2 squared D minus 1. All right. So this is a this is a limit on how good a spectral expander you can construct, and this is the definition of a Ramanujan graph. So a graph is Ramanujan if all of its non-trivial eigenvalues are most two square root d minus one. So these are optimal spectral expanders. Okay. So one of the great things about these graphs is that they actually exist. So Margulis and Lubatsky Philip Sarnak showed that when p is equal to p plus one, where p is a prime number, there are infinite sequences of Robinson and graphs for uh, this degree D. And the graphs that they constructed were Cayley graphs of uh, PSL2 of Z mod QZ, and they, they used some number theory and, uh, well, they used number theory, theory and uh, the Robinson conjecture to reason about the spectral gap, and that's why they're called Robinson graphs. Okay, so until recently, this was the only known construction for these graphs uh, that actually meet this bound. But there's a very nice result of treatment that says that a random graph is pretty close, but not close. So in any case, it's left open this sort of very natural question, what happens when D is not equal to prime plus one? What if D is equal to four? And you know, the conceptual point here is that do these things exist because of some sort of number theoretic, theoretic reason, or is it something more generic than that? So the theorem that we proved last year is that you know, there are infinite families of bipartite numbers and graphs for every D bigger than equal to three. Okay, and the proof does not use number theory, and uh, we prove the theorem by proving the, this nice conjecture of and linear from a few years ago, which is that every Ramanujan graph has a two cover, which is also Ramanujan. So this says that for every graph you can double its size and keep the eigenvalues small, and we prove this using this interlacing polynomials methodology that I just showed you. Okay, so let me just say a couple of lines about the proof. Um, okay. So, what I'm going to show you is, is a way to almost prove this theorem just by a black box application of the proof of Weaver's conjecture that I showed you. Okay, so here's how you do it. You start with a graph G, 
and you turn it into a bunch of vectors. So what you do is for every edge i j, you look at the vector e i minus e j. Uh, so this is a plus one position i minus one position j, you get a bunch of vectors. It turns out if the original graph is, is Ramanujan, these vectors are nearly isotropic. All right, so their quadratic form is close to the sphere. That's almost the definition of free normal, actually. And the norms are bounded by something that depends on the degree. So you have a bunch of short isotropic vectors. You can apply this theorem to find a partition of them into two sets. Each of, and each part is close to half isotropic. So its quadratic form is you know, close to half times the sphere. But now each of these subsets corresponds to a subgraph, right? So you've actually partitioned the graph into two subgraphs. And because each of these things looks like a sphere, there's a very sort of precise sense in which each of these graphs looks like the original graph. All right? And now, uh, so let's look at these two graphs. There's a sort of very easy, basically linear algebra fact, which is very nice due to Bilu and Linear, which shows that given any two such graphs, given any partition of the graph into two graphs that look like it, you can construct a good two cover of the graph. This sounds complicated, it's not complicated, it's a linear algebra exercise. Okay, and uh, that's it, right? So if you can find a good partition, you can get a good two cover. And if you do this whole argument just in a black box way, you get graphs with eigenvalues four square of D. And then if you do it, if, if you then open up the proof and analyze the polynomials that you get using not just generic uh, log derivative perturbation and stuff, but using some actual combinatorial reasoning you have in a leap, you actually get 2 square root d minus 1. Alright? Okay. Okay, so so that's it. I guess I'm out of time. Let me just, here's the summary. Okay, the main theorem is you can partition any set of vectors into two sets with similar quadratic forms. The proof is based on analyzing a special kind of random matrix, the uh, sum of uh, independent random rank one matrices. And the point of this proof technique is it reduces this problem of searching for a partition to just analyzing roots of a polynomial, which is an analytic problem. And then this, is, this has a lot of consequences because you can encode all kinds of different objects as you know, quadratic forms or as matrices, and two of the consequences are what I showed you, the existence of paintings which proves the Kevin Singer conjecture and this two cover the So, so that's, uh, that's it. Yeah, so their conjecture was about non bipartite graphs. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so what I showed you is not actually, their conjecture is, is actually a lot, uh, okay, so their original conjecture is every D regular graph, not even, doesn't have to be Ramanujan, has a two cover for which the new eigenvalues in the two cover are Ramanujan. And so, what we proved is the special case of that for bipartite graphs. So, the non bipartite is slow. Uh, yes? Right. Uh, you mean explain the reduction? Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Um, okay, so. Okay, so, so, okay, so the Kadden-Singer problem is a question about uh, uniqueness of pure state extensions on this algebra of diagonal matrices, right? Um, so, it's kind of hard to get your hands on what these uh, pure states look like. Uh, but there is, uh, there is a special case on which uh, it's sort of easy to check how pure states behave, and that is projection matrices. So th this uh, this conjecture here, uh, I mean, okay, if, if, if such a paving exists, uh, then I mean, okay, so m maybe I can tell you offline. But basically, these things correspond to diagonal projection matrices, and the behavior of pure states on those things is well understood. And if you can find such a paving, you can relate what happens to this to what happens on these. Uh, I mean, okay, I'll, I can tell you about it later. Okay. Uh -huh. At the very end, you said you can partition a set of vectors. Do you want to just say a sentence about algorithms? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so what important, 
other open problem, which I should have mentioned, is that all of this stuff is completely uh, not algorithmic. So this interlacing argument just proves the existence of a polynomial. There's no known algorithm which finds this, uh, finds this polynomial and therefore this partition in less than exponential time. So if you actually want to, I mean, if you actually, there, there are many uses for this kind of thing in computer science and other areas. If you, uh, if you can find an algorithm that would make it a lot better. Yes, please. Thanks, okay.